people always ask how I balance my family life with 400 shows a year. I'm just doing what I love with the people I love. It's my magic life. I like Wes Isley. I like everything about him. All right. This week, I'm going off notes because I do not want to mess this up. Tonight's guest has literally performed all over the world in front of 100,000 seat audiences. He has number, numerous television specials, NBC, Discovery, TLC, CBC, TNN, uh, and so many more. He has his own television show, had his own television show. And uh, last week he couldn't be with us because he was on a movie set. Um, but today we got him. Everybody, it's the world's greatest escape artist, Dean Gunnerson. What's up, buddy? How are you? Hey. Hey, great. Hey, thank you guys so much for having me on. Sorry, I, I got tied up last week and uh couldn't make it but we're here today and i'm i'm happy to be be uh be part of it i mean your 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 podcasts are uh, are really good you know really enjoy them thank you very much man that means the world to me and and this uh introduction did you no justice because uh <laughs> the stuff that you have going on the stuff that you've done and the things you've done over your career amazing that's all i can say is amazing i first found out about you on the um the magic of Disney television show with George Burns. That was the first time I ever saw you. I was a kid. I had it on VHS. I watched it over and over. What a fun, great, just family magic television special that was. And you were like the yeah. highlight into that show. Well, I mean, I don't know if I was a highlight. I mean, I was still pretty young myself. Actually, when we filmed that, it was the night of my 24th birthday. So I spent my 24th birthday uh, locked in a shark cage underwater at Disneyland in uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I mean, like, wow, that was just really cool. You had, you know, George Burns and Siegfried and Roy and Lance Burton and the Pin Dragons and uh, Harry Anderson. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was, it was a magical, magical uh, evening. And, uh, you know, I got, I, I got to uh, escape. It was, uh, my, my my first NBC special and you know what better place to do it in the most magical place on earth isn't that Disneyland so it was it was cool but yeah that was a long time ago have you topped that birthday or has that just the best birthday ever well you know what as you know as performers right you're always traveling and you know different places so you spend birthdays anniversaries trees holidays you know on on the road so you know that i've had lots and lots of birthdays uh in various countries doing lots of crazy things but that, that one was pretty special i mean to, to be honest with you like that that evening was really hard um and and doing magic on tv is is challenging but doing an escapes on tv i find is even harder because uh, people just want that magic moment, that that the money shot, I kind of call it. And with escapes, it's a lot about the setup. Uh, first, you got to convince people that you can escape before you can escape, right? Because uh, being an escape artist is, is kind of like going on stage as a comedian and telling your punchline first, right? The answer to your joke and then going back and and telling the joke. Because when you come up and you tell people, you know, you're going to get locked up, they know you're going to escape. You don't have that element of surprise, right? As a magician, you go on stage, they don't know if you're going to make somebody appear, disappear, float. You know, they don't know. But as an escape artist, they know. They know what you're going to do. They know the, they know the ending. You're going to escape. It's just how bad is the acting going to be until that happens? So you, you, you really have to convince people that, that you can't do it or the difficulties so that they understand this of what you're going to do. And I was working with a director that he, he, didn't, he, he, he didn't want that. He just wanted the escape. And I had a weight belt because uh, we were filming during the middle of the night and I needed the weight to kind of keep me down so that the camera could see me. He didn't like that. He made me take it off. He didn't like my goggles. He just... He wanted little tiny goggles. And, you know, these were all important elements because, you know, with the escapes, they're, they're real and the, the danger is real for me. And so anyway, we went and we went to film it 
And as soon as they put me in the water without the weight belt, I kind of got stuck to the top of the cage. And the safety divers had to come in and pull me out. And we scratched the whole set. So, you know, three o'clock in the morning, they're pulling me out of this cage. It's it was it was the end of January in California. So, you know, it was still a little cool. I'm disheveled. Pull me out. The director, you know, starts yelling. OK, dry your hair and uh, put on a weight belt, and your goggles and let's do this again. And it was like, oh, my goodness. Right. So, you know, he wasn't taking the advice that I, I needed to do this. And I, I was young and inexperienced enough to to, um, to, you know, to to put my safety aside and just do what he wanted. I mean, as you know, the director is always boss, but as performers, we have to give her a certain limit. So we went and uh, we put the weight belt on, the goggles went and we got it in the second take. And that's that's the only escape I've ever done on television in my life that I ever had to film twice. Everything else is one take, one shot, get it, or uh, it's not going to happen. So, yeah. Uh, Rothless, it's not Rothless Burger. Who was the guy that did the announcing for you? The guy from Cheers. What is his name? Yeah. All I can think is George. Yeah, John Rothsberger. Cliff. Cliff. Cliff, the millman from Cheers. Nice. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Everything yeah, about it was awesome. Morgan Freeman was on it. Not Morgan Freeman. Uh, Morgan Fairchild was on it. Yeah, you know, like 80s, 80s, 80s people, 80s acts. You know, so, I mean, I've done television before that. My, my first U.S. special was, uh, that was 88, was 87. I did an episode uh, called In Search for Houdini. It was a two-hour live broadcast. Uh, William Shatner was the host. Uh, David Copperfield was on it. Harry Blackstone, Jr., uh, the the Penn and Teller, uh, the amazing Randy, uh, Steve Banachuk, and they, it was like a live special. And then at the end of the show, they were going to have a seance to bring Houdini back. And on that episode, uh, because it was live television, and this was like I was just a kid from Canada getting getting on the show. And then Randy got hurt just before we went live on the air, and I had to go on and do the milk can uh, escape form. And uh, that was a special Halloween. That, that was like, you know, we talk about uh, special holidays on on, uh, uh, on being away. And, and that Halloween was my most memorable Halloween ever. And anyway, I went to do that. And then after that, uh, that show, uh, the Pendragons were on it where Charlotte kind of lost her clothes. Okay. Uh, we have, we have seen that clip. Yeah. Yeah. People, <laughs> all, yeah, yeah. people always, always remember that. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, uh, about what a year, Shatner, year and a half. Or Shatner trying to cover was the thing that made it memorable, too. Yeah, I even made Dick Clark's bloopers and stuff. But it was funny. I, I hadn't seen William Shatner since that aired. And about two years ago or so, I met him at a Comic-Con. And uh, I came up and I wanted him to sign my my program from there. I had all the other acts on it, but I never got a chance to get him to sign it. And so I said, hi, Mr. Shatner. I don't know if you remember me, blah, blah, blah. And he's going, yeah. He goes, was that the one where the, the, the lady lost her clothes? And I go, yeah, that's the one. He goes, oh, yeah, I remember that. He did exactly what you just did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody remembers <laughs> Copperfield or Blackstone or, you know, Ben and Teller, but they, they remember the Pendragons. So... That's hilarious. Oh, that's awesome. That's well, awesome. It's, it's funny, but poor Charlotte. That's what's remembered. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, as an act, yeah, it was it was very, you know, devastating, and you know, you sad to happen. But uh, you know, I mean, that's that's show business, right? I mean, Randy, he ended up getting taken to the hospital, right? He, he threw out his back. I mean, the, after that, he retired from escapes and. Uh, Named me as his successor and gave me all his old equipment and and handcuffs, oh, wow. and hanging apparatus, and his milk can. I don't know if you can see it in the background, but I actually have uh, Randy's milk can somewhere in the background. Can you see? Wow, Randy's can back there with a poster of Randy yeah. right above that, it. That that yeah that that I know your your people listening won't be able to see that, but. But, uh, you know, that's a really big can from, you know, a really big cow. But that milk can was actually used on the episode of Happy Days as well, when Randy appeared on Happy Days in 1978. 
and uh, Fonzie, Henry Winkler, got locked into it in that episode and, uh, and escaped. So it's, it's, a, it's a special can. That's very special. That's like magic history, television show history, all rolled into one. I mean, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that that's always been an important part of me as as an escape artist, as a performer is, is trying, you know, save that that magic history. Uh, as I can see by your background, you, you you've got a lot of a lot of cool stuff. Um, and, you know, that, that's the thing with me here, here. I call I call my my magic shop my my morgue because of all the stuff in there. But also behind me, I've like Doug Henning's water torture cell that he used on his first TV special in 1975. Um, and, you know, different different things, lots of props from different different magicians that, that you know, I've worked with and, and things. And uh, I've got, uh, uh, last year was the 100th anniversary of the International Brother of Magicians. And uh, not everybody knows, but the International Brother of Magicians actually started here in Canada in, in a city called Winnipeg in 1922, February 10th, 1922. And the very first member and the very first president was a man by the name of Len Ventus. And he started the IBM when he was 19. And he was member number one, uh, like I said, the first president. And he got the IBM started with, with uh, Gene Gordon. Um, and I, when he became a, a good friend and a good mentor of mine, he passed away in 1999, but before he passed away, he gave me all his linking rings uh, and all his props and, and letters that he wrote and wrote to magicians for over 70 years. Um, so I have like the very first uh, linking rings all the way up. I have his old typewriter that he used to type all his stuff, all his number one IBM member cards. Um, so it's really cool when, when, you, when you know somebody and, and you've experienced part of that magic and then, then to kind of keep on with the, uh, the legacy of it, you know, and hold it on for the, for the next generation or the next person that, that comes after you, such as what with Randy did, did with me. Well, those who don't know, the Linking Ring is the monthly magazine for the International Brotherhood of Magicians. So you have like issue one. Mine goes back to, I think, 43. I have a collection that dates back to 1943, but yours goes back to... February 1st, uh, or sorry, February 10th, 19, 1922. Uh, I have them here. I'll, I'll show them on the, the video later on. And you can see in the people listening, if they want to go back and watch your uh, your visual version, uh, can actually see the, the very first copies of, of the Lincoln Ring. So they uh, started they the ring right away. They didn't wait to put out a monthly magazine. They started it right away? Yeah, well, the first... The, the the first few issues were uh, like a newsletter. Okay. Um, so, and there was only 20 issues of the very first one. So it was kind of a newsletter and introducing. And uh, Lynn wanted to be an international correspondence. And then it wasn't until uh, 1925 where they actually went into the booklet format uh, with with the picture on, on the cover. But all the first episodes are the first publications were uh, were newsletters, so they're, they're really rare and hard to come by. But ironically, Houdini uh, performed in Winnipeg a uh, hundred years ago last week, and he hung from the old uh, Winnipeg Free Press newspaper building, escaping from a straitjacket that he used to do in a lot of cities. And Len Ventus went to see Houdini performing at the Orpheum uh, to try and get him to join the International Brotherhood of Magicians, but. Houdini being the president of the Society of American Magicians at the time would have nothing to do with this, you know, young guy trying to start up a, a, a new magic organization. And uh, so he kind of chased them off. But it wasn't long after that Harry Blackstone Sr. actually joined and became member number 10 to help give the IBM the credibility that it needed. So, Oh, that's awesome. That's really cool. Yeah. Really cool, man. So... Yeah. Uh, so we talked about your early television specials, but what came first for you? Was it magic or was it escapes? Did you fall in love with escapes before magic? Well, the first book I ever got was, was a book on Houdini when I was like 10 years old. So it was Houdini that got me interested in magic because, you know, and Houdini's inspired a, a, a lot of uh, magicians over, over the decades. 
And so I write about this great man that traveled around the world doing all these impossible things, getting out of straitjackets, chains, making an elephant disappear, walking through brick walls. And I go, wow, that's that's cool. He's he's like a real life comic book hero. And so, you know, as a 10 year old, I mean, you can't really get into handcuffs or straitjackets. But, you know, I remember letting my friends tie me up and, you know, starting to learn some magic and 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 that sort of thing so when i actually uh first got into magic i actually started like with doves and you know doing doing birthday parties that sort of thing and then i kind of got more interested in the escapes uh in my teenage years and kind of switched to, to that field um uh, ironically one of my best friends is james seelan who lives in las vegas he's he's uh one of the top cruise uh, ship performers for the last 30, 40 years. Like he's, he, 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 he's uh, always, always on the boats. And uh, he grew up in Winnipeg before he moved to Vegas, but he started as an escape artist and I started with dubs and then we eventually switched. Uh, and James went on to become uh, an IBM gold medal winner and he run the Las Vegas uh, Six Fairway Lions Head Award with his, with his uh, award-winning dub act. And uh, became a you know a, a famous magician with his with his uh, dubs and and magic and I did my thing with handcuffs. So you never know what life brings. Does he take his dubs on the road with him on the boat with him, or does he leave the dubs? Uh, he did, but again with with the transition of uh, I mean this is going back to the eighties and nineties and two thousand with. with Traveling with birds now, I think, is really tough uh, with all the diseases and stuff. So then he switched and, and was using small dogs in his, okay. in his act uh, and with his with his illusions. You know, a dog you can take anywhere. Uh, you know, everything that James has done has, has been, uh, you know, just pure magic, pure pure gold. But uh, and uh, so, but we we still remain friends for. For all these years and that's the cool part about magic is the friendships that we develop um you know over, over our time and working with them and and i've had such a great honor to work with so many so many great magicians it's uh um you know the, the list is long I, i'm forever indebted to to all the friends i've met in the in the magic world I look at it as a brotherhood. I mean, I've heard, you know, there's little clicks and people that, you know, hey, don't talk to that guy, that guy's whatever. They're, you're a magician, you're family to me because we are on the road and we don't get to see each other, but we have a language, we have things we can talk to that other people don't get. And I bond, I need that every once in a while. I need to talk to a magician. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you guys under, understand that. And, and I love your RV too. Man, that that is just the coolest thing. I mean, to drive around with the with an RV and your kids and you know your 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 big logos all on the side. I mean, that's just like wow. That is so so cool. Oh, thanks. Hey, it, 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 the potty is what made it worth it on the road. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And, and you know, it, it's great now. It's a 2019, so it's new to us, but it's practically new right and um they bought it during the pandemic took it yeah. on a couple of trips and then it just set so it was very low mileage yeah yeah but my kids are two and a half and they're boys <laughs> and they're going to learn to potty train setting down because <laughs> on the road trying to aim that thing we, <laughs> we wow. gotta nip in the wow. <laughs> you just have to teach them in the shower <laughs> i guess Put it in the shower. There you go. There you we go. Do that. You have a drink in the shower. There you go. <laughs> so, oh, oh, let's get back to you. Let's get back to you. Um, uh, do you ever get sick of the comparison to Harry Houdini, or you you just always love that you? Because at this point, you've actually topped Houdini in coming up with an original and do, doing more than him. You know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've outlived Houdini. Uh, so, I mean, that's a bit of an accomplishment, I, I, I guess. But, yeah, I mean, to be able to survive in, in this business, uh, you know, I've, I've been per performing for over, over 40 years, right? Hang I started hanging from buildings when I was 18 years old. 
Um, and you know, I'm, I'm 59 now. So, you know, 41 years I've been hanging from buildings, doing big escapes, you know, getting chained up, thrown out of airplanes, locked in cars and crushed, uh, shark cages underwater, packing crates. So over my lifetime, I've been able to do, you know, most of Houdini's great escapes, but like any band, you can sing the Beatles songs, but sooner or later, you got to start writing your own. You know, same with magic, right? You can you can buy a magic trick off the counter, but make, what makes it really special is develop it into your own routine, into your own personality. And even better is if you can create a, an effect uh, that, you know, just fools people, that fools other magicians. Um you know, then then that's that's it. And I I think I've I've left part of my legacy is in some of the escapes that I've I've created. Um, you know, I, I do them for me, but you know, like when I uh on World's Most Dangerous Magic, when I hung by my my toes from a feet, uh, hung from my feet from a trapeze, 726 feet over the Hoover Dam in Las Vegas. Um you know, being locked in a car and crushed, um, which was really cool. Lance Burton had asked if he could do that on one of his shows. And uh, I said, Ab absolutely. Uh, you know, I've, I've done Houdini's water torture cell on milk can, but, you know, all those require curtains. So I've developed the next generation of, and, of doing like uh, more of a modern, uh, milk can or can that requires no curtains that the audience can see the entire struggle developed. I, I like to call it the, the Russian death tank. I developed it before, unfortunately, the, the war in uh, the Ukraine. So now I just call it the death tank, but it was originally de developed when I was touring near Russia. Uh, you know, water tank, a big water tank that that doesn't require any, any curtains. Um, and you know, lots, lots of, lots of, lots of things like this. On so my, my TV series, we did lots of stuff, getting chained to roller coasters, and you know, being buried alive for you know two days with no food or water, and then escaping or uh, being locked in coffins and thrown in the ocean with sharks, uh, locked up on Viking ships with lit on fire out in the middle of the North Atlantic and lice in Iceland and have to escape before they blow up. Um, so, you know, yeah, I, uh, I like, I like creating and, and designing and, and doing things. I have one, I can't quite show you, but I'm looking at it that I designed for a, a, a TV show coming up that again is unique and crazy. Um, you know, I've been buried alive in concrete, like uh, two and a half tons of concrete sealed inside having to escape. Um, it was featured in one of the Ripley's Believe It or Not books uh, a few years ago. They did like a two-page spread on that. So um, so I'm just thinking about logistics. When you were on this pirate ship, were you in international waters? Because it <laughs> blows up. You don't have well, to sign paper work. You don't have to do all this. Were you, were you 13 miles off? How does that yeah, work? No, actually, actually, it was a Viking ship. It was a Viking ship in Iceland. Um, so yeah, we were no, we were close to the shores, but yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, there's still regulations and stuff that you got to do. That, that's one thing why I always like working in China because China, I, I, I'm, I don't know how many times I got changed roller coasters and stuff out there, or you know, you do crazy things, and it's like, yeah, whatever you want to do. There's no, there's no safety. There's no regulations. You don't need insurance. You just, yeah, whatever you want to do, they'll just let you do it. Right. And uh, what do they have? Six billion people? You can be spared. It's okay. We have more. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. If you don't make it back. And yeah, one of my TV specials there, I, I was I, I was doing an escape from a roller coaster and I was just a split second off. And the coaster had like these kind of Batman wings that flow out. And as I was diving away, it's is a really good perspective how life can change quickly. As you know, in like video, you have like 26 frames per second. Um, and I have a frame of this sec of, of this a second of video. And the one frame I'm flying through the air like Superman escaping from these chains. 
and locks as the as the roller coaster is coming. And the next frame of that twenty six, the roller coaster hits my ankle and and shattered my my ankle and and flipped me around like like a a frog in a blender. Um, and uh, now, did Lance Burton copy you on that one as well? Did he? Um, or was no, that an independent, different type? Yeah, no. Uh, uh, no disrespect to Lance, but I mean, when I do these escapes, I mean, there's no camera tricks or. Hey, I mean, I'm. Okay, I, okay. What, what I'm doing yeah, is, is very, very real. Actually, the the uh, the original idea for that was from uh, Johnny Thompson uh, for the escape from a roller coaster, but but. Um, no, because you said that he borrowed or asked your uh, to do the uh, car crushing. So yeah. I thought that may have came at a second time for his other special to ask for that. Yeah, no, there wasn't any any exchange on on that one. He he kind of came up with a little different version on it and stuff. And yeah. Yeah. well, same yeah. with the car crusher too. But anyway, I like I said when when I get locked up to something or put in the car, I mean I'm really getting in the car crusher. I'm really going. I mean. Are same with the roller coaster. I mean, I'm really there. That that danger aspects is there. I mean, I've broken almost every bone in my body at one time or another. I've lost body parts. I've busted out my teeth. You know, I've I don't know how many times I've been up in the hospital. I've you know, I've died in an escape. Um, Howie Mandel actually said, "Well, he said, well, well, you must not be very good then because you get hurt so many times." And I said, He's "Well, the world's greatest escape artist." <laughs> I don't know. It's it's the realism. I mean, evil can evil. I mean, you know, he he made a few trips to the hospital too. I mean, when when you're baking a cake, you you, you gotta crack a few eggs sometimes, right? So that's the way I looked at. It. I mean, not not that you know you want to get hurt, but I mean, yeah, sometimes you gotta gotta break a few eggs. So I was totally thinking evil can evil when you were describing all those things. I mean, yeah. it's the same. It's that thrill, that danger, that death is intimate. Not intimate. What is it? Imminent. Imminent. It's right there. Death is right there. Evil can evil, and then it gets rushed off to the hospital at the end. Luckily, you don't have that every single time you perform, but it does right. happen. Do, is you, your, do you get nervous still, though, or is it just we're not really? I think nervous. Is, I think nervous is a good thing. I, I don't think okay. I don't care what type of a performer you are. Getting nervous before a show is a good thing because it makes you try. It gets your your you know, your adrenaline flowing, it, it gives you a right. certain clarity. If you have fear, that's a bad thing. You don't want fear, but you want to be nervous. You know, I, I'm sure you guys have had it, right? Oh yeah, this show is going to be a cakewalk. Yeah, no problem. Boom, you go out and you just fall flat. But if you're you're nervous and you're excited, it, it creates that energy to make you do well. So, and yeah. speaking about evil Knievel and Houdini, uh, well, one of the things I'll, you, you'll be the first I'll, I'll tell this to, I haven't even posted on social media or anything yet, but there's a new series on the History Channel right now called The Goat, Goat, with greatest of all time, and it's hosted by Peyton Manning, and new episodes come out every Monday, and they have an episode coming up on uh, the greatest of all time daredevils, and so... They flew me to New York, and I talk about who is the greatest daredevil of all time. Was it Evil Knievel? Was it Houdini? Was it Chuck Yeager? Johnny Knoxville? You know, they go through all these different daredevils, and we we try and figure out who was the greatest of all time. So that'll be coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if anybody's listening, to keep an eye out for it. the the series they host. What's the greatest sports stadium of all time? Or you know, the greatest at this, but like I said, the one coming up is on who is the greatest daredevil on all time. I didn't quite make the cut. I got bumped out by Johnny Knoxville, but, you know, I got to talk about it. That's awesome. That, it sounds like a really neat episode, yeah. That's really Yeah, it cool. is. I mean, not to give anything away, but Johnny Knoxville didn't have my vote because I thought, you know, I love his movies, I love his acting, but I, I didn't think, you know, getting kicked in the groin really makes you a daredevil. But, you know, that's <laughs> That was just my <laughs> humble. He did stand there and take a bullet, and uh, he did get hit by a bull several times and get slipped. And that's just, I don't know if it's Daredevil or just stupidity. I mean, <laughs> Evil Knievel was using regular motorcycles like Harleys back in the day and had no oh, yeah. anything on it. And that's just 
to my opinion, because I ride a bike, stupidity. Uh, but he, they didn't have the <laughs> the bounciness, the dirt bike type thing. Yeah, they didn't have all the uh, yeah, all hydraulics. The shocks. No shocks. Yeah, he, Thank you. I'm yeah, losing that yeah, word. He, yeah. Evil had like big heavy Harleys. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. 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 That was crazy. And, yeah, and big humongous. Uh, you know, he was he was a brave man. <laughs> uh, something something so you're telling your, tolerance <laughs> i hope anyway goodness your television show your your tv show that you did it was called i have it right here i wrote it down i can't find it right now escape or die do yes. you have DVDs of that i can buy i couldn't find anything on your website i'd love to have a dvd or can i find it somewhere yeah i well, i'll send you the link to it uh, it was seen around the world. It, it won uh, Best Documentary Series in Canada, uh, airing. It was on the Outdoor Life Network. It aired in every country in the world, China, India, India this, on the Discovery Channel and Sony Entertainment in Asia, but it never went to the United States. Uh, they didn't want to pay very much money for it. And so the production company didn't, didn't release it to the States. Which yeah, I didn't care. I just wanted it to be seen, but uh, it was it was it was kind of kind of cool, and uh, you know we got really good ratings, and so we were all set for uh, another season. But then the Rogers Media, which is like a huge huge media company in Canada, the CEO got replaced because he spent too many billions of dollars on the hockey broadcast, and so a lot of the shows that he'd had or wanted got kind of set aside for the new person but you know it's i'd, I'd love to to bring it back again it, it was it was a lot of fun how many episodes did you do uh we on the first season we did 12 episodes but like i said each episode was in a different different country uh and like i said each episode starts in my morgue we decide what we're going to do uh you know like we went to malaysia and i got locked into a snake pick filled with like uh, a couple dozen pit vipers and the uh, Malaysian military locked me up in their their maximum security handcuffs and I got to get out while all these pit vipers are climbing all over me uh and I I hate snakes I really hate snakes and they're like all on me trying to bite me uh we went to like Colombia and did an escape from a crane they had 150 feet in the air and a burning rope and uh oh just all kinds of cool 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 stuff but it was so i know but it was i know i did an upside down straight jacket escape nothing compared to you i'm like i'm like little kid in preschool hanging on the monkey bars saying i'm a gymnast i'm not uh, compared to you i'm not but mine i had to sign waivers with the uh county fair with the with the operator of the forklift and with the uh rental. the rental company where we got the cherry picker from what is it like when you go to other countries? Do, are they helping you, the production team? Or are you there for every license and contract negotiation trying to get all these regulations approved? It's got to be a logistical nightmare. Uh, yeah, it's challenging. And, of course, it's gotten harder and harder over the years. Um, a few years ago, I was performing in uh, Australia uh, in Melbourne, and they wanted me to do uh, – Straight jacket escape hanging from a crane again, 100, 150 feet in the air. And the regulations that we had to go through, like just like safety people and uh, the worker safety board and coming out and watching every show and, and you know, the checklist and, and think, I mean, it's all, I guess it's all good, but I mean, man, you know, the old days, I used to call up the crane company and say, hey, you know, Come, come, uh, you know, hang me up. It's like, yeah, okay, where do we go? Pull up, you know, tie in, hang me upside down and go. But yeah, all, all that's changed. There's so much liability and regulation and takes the fun out of it. How did you get approval for the Hoover Dam? Because you did well, not have anything tied around your ankles. You did not. Every time I see that, my mom didn't talk to me for three months when I did an upside down straight jacket escape. And I had chains around my ankles that you could pull a bus with. It was regulated to pull a bus. These were heavy duty chains. You had nothing around your ankles. You were hanging on only by your boots. Unless yeah, actually, there was a trick. I don't know if you can see, but right above me, I have uh, that trapeze. I don't know if you can see oh, it. Oh, cool. 
Yeah. There's not much to it, Nat. It's just a bar. Hanging, yeah. hanging from my ceiling. Yeah. I got a monkey up there. But uh, <laughs> yeah, G Gary Willett. Uh, who produced a lot of the David Copperfield specials and uh, the world's greatest magic series. Uh, he developed the, the world's most dangerous magic series. And so when he called me up and said, you know, what can we do over Hoover Dam? He wanted to use that location. And we talked about ideas and uh, we talked about the trapeze idea. And man, it, it was, it was tough. I had to really train. I, I always look at my escapes as like a, uh, a boxer training for a boxing match you know you whether you got to practice holding your breath or you got to practice from heights or whatever you're you're facing you you have to focus and train on on that and um, that there was a lot of training and, and when we got there I'd been to Vegas like lots and lots of times but I never had time to go see Hoover Dam who wants to go see a dam when you you know you can go see a uh, Siegfried and Roy or Lance Burton or David Copperfield or you know like it wasn't high on my list. So when we went out there to film it, I saw Hoover Dam for the first time in real. And I had the driver pull up to the dam and I stopped and looked over the side because it used to be the highway that connected Arizona. And I go, I remember telling my safety coordinator, I said, man, I said, what the heck did we get into? Because it's high. It's really, really high. And so when we were doing that, we had to block the highway down so that we could film and have the crane on there. And I asked that same question to, to Gary. I said, Gary, I said, man, how did you get permission to do this on the dam? And he just went lots and lots of money. So I don't know. I wasn't involved. I mean, it's a big production, but he, he got it done. But the, the ironic part of when we were negotiating for that, the series is called World's Most Dangerous Magic. And they had, you know, a bunch of magicians doing dangerous magic tricks and stuff. And a little trick that I use is, is uh, I'll negotiate as much money as I can. And then when I'm done and we're finished, I say, oh, yeah, you got to give me danger pay because the, the after union says you get an extra, you know, bonus if something's dangerous. And so we negotiate. And then I say, OK, I want my danger bonus. And uh, he goes, no, it's not dangerous. What, what do you mean? No, no, no. You, you, we, we can't, we can't pay you your danger bonus. And, you know, it's like an extra thirty-two percent or something, right? It's like, no. Oh. I said, this show. What's the show called? World's most dangerous magic. I said, yeah, it's it's dangerous. He said, no, no, we, we can't pay you danger pay. So I was like, okay, whatever. I didn't get my danger pay. But when we went there to do it, they're going, okay, we're going to set all these cameras up on this side. We've got a helicopter, boom. We'll get you to do the escape. And then when you're done, we'll bring you back in. And then we're going to move all the cameras to the other side, and we'll get you to do it again. And I go, what? I said, no, that, that, that can't happen. He said, yeah, we need to get all the different shots. I said, you know what? This is going to happen one one time only. So I said, you put your cameras wherever you want. And I said, you got one shot to get this right. So and they're like, what? What? You know, because, you know, usually, you know, magic goes, you, you know, you do again, you do again, you do it again till you get it right. And I was like, no, man, one time, one time only. So and then the helicopter guy got nervous. He thought I was going to die. And he actually flew away. The helicopter laughed. But uh, it got good. Good, because uh, I worry about really, the wind really from that dude, right? Well, he he was higher it. up. Mm -hmm. he, yeah, he he was he was high up. He wasn't that close. Again, we had to make sure that he didn't he didn't come too close because yeah, that would have just blown me off. Any gust coming through that channel, uh, the gorge. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's there's a lot of lot of things that you have to figure out and calculate in in your head when you're 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 doing this stuff. So. Now I'm thinking like a magician. I'm putting rigging underneath my pant leg. I'm I'm doing a camera edit. And here I am. But now I'm editing and, and safety, 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 man. That, that my hands are sweating thinking about this. I don't I don't like yeah. it. I know you survived, but oh, oh. And and you know what? That that's just it. I can speak about the safety aspect because I've I've had my share of accidents. So you know, I get I get young people coming up to me or, or young escape artists. I've, I've consulted on a number of different TV shows over the years or or helped other magician or escape artists on, on TV shows. 
and to work out their safety aspects because yeah, man, it's, it's, it's a serious, serious business. You know, nothing in this business is worth getting, you know, killed over. Absolutely nothing. And, and unfortunately, um, you know, there, there have been people that have, that have died, uh, you know, including from, you, from, sir. Yeah. Including you. Yeah. Yeah. I was just fortunate enough to come back to life. So, you know, I, I got my, my second chance, but yeah, you know, I, I saw the, the, the lights and the tunnels, you know, I got chained up, put in that coffin over there and underwater for like over four minutes into this icy cold river in Canada. And, uh, you know, we had 10,000 people there cheer me on. I was 19 years old and, uh, you know, they realized I wasn't going to make it out. After four minutes, they pulled me up, ripped open the lid. I'm like, I was blue and conscious and dead. And uh, wow. there's some video on it on YouTube somewhere. Uh, but yeah, it was it was pretty pretty scary, pretty pretty intense. But it made the front page of every Canadian newspaper a full page in the the National Enquirer. Uh, Johnny Carson talked about it, uh, and it, and you know, it could have ended my my career right there i could have just said no that's it i'm done my mom probably would have preferred that but you know you, uh-huh. you, 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 you got you got a dream you got a goal you got you got to follow it right i mean magic is more than a job it's it's a passion so can you say what went wrong or do you not want to uh, yeah do you yeah, know no, what- no. i mean it, it, it was a learning experience sometimes our our best uh, learning experience are from failure. And uh-huh. so with the coffin, uh, it, the way it sank into the water, they, they put it in at an angle. It was drilled full of holes to fill full of water as well. Uh, but being made out of wood, it, it, it didn't quite sink as fast. We had it weighted down with bricks and stuff. Um, the river was a really black, murky river. Uh, Winnipeg is actually uh, an Aboriginal term for muddy water, uh, which this river was named out of. It's like the Red River. Uh, and so when it went in, I, I, I used my diaphragm. I filled up my lungs to the full capacity, but it got stuck in this air pocket where it wasn't going down all the way. So I wait, I wait, and I decide, you know what, I need to take another breath of air. So I exhaled and I pushed every little bit of oxygen out of my lungs. To, to grab another breath. And just as I pushed that last little bit of air out, then it sank. It just went bloop. And so oh. I got stuck underwater with like no air, no air in my lungs whatsoever. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, the water was cold and black and I knew I wasn't going to have enough time to escape. And so I just, you know, trying to relax, trying to meditate, stay calm, stay calm. And uh, poof, the lights went out. Wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, I, I would have been freaking out. That's good that you stayed calm, though. That probably, you know, you know saved it. Staying, staying calm uh, is one of the most important things that we can have in life, whether it's performing escapes or magic or dealing with a crisis situation or having kids, right? You know, you know, you, it, it's important to stay calm and not to panic because when you panic, you uh, you stop thinking clearly, and yeah. you need to think clearly. Um, and so it was a valuable lesson for me, and uh, you know one that I've I've you know kept with me for the last forty years. How long was it before you did an underwater escape again? Uh, I was out of the hospital the next day, having a press conference, ready to go back at it. Uh, oh, wow. I want I wanted to get back in that river. Uh, but the city police and all the publicity, they yeah, and have frowned away from it. So it, it, it uh, you know. Uh, it, you went to Disney me. World. You What's that? Disney World. You did it in front of Mickey instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. So, yeah, I mean, I had to switch to doing more like water tanks and, and stuff for, for a bit. But, you know, I... I've been chained up and jumped off bridges and, you know, it, it, it evolves up again. I mean, I was never afraid to get back in the water. So, um, so tell us about, uh, Britain's got talent. 
Uh, Canada's got talent. Canada's yeah, got yeah, talent. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that's right. Canada is kind of like a state of Britain. I don't know. People, uh, you know, we have. If we have not we, America's got talent. It's all the same to me. It's not AGT. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, we, we, we still got the queen on our money. They Nobody's told us yet that she's not the queen anymore, but I think sometimes soon we'll, they'll change the money and there'll be a king on it. I don't know. But, but yeah, I've always shied away from the Got Talent shows. Uh, I've been asked for years and years to be on the different ones. I've always said no. Um, but they made me a really special offer to do this one for Canada's Got Talent. Uh, it was in Niagara Falls, and I've always loved Niagara Falls. When I was a teenager, they had the Houdini Museum there, uh, and I used to love going there and seeing all the props from Houdini and Henry Mueller, who owned the, uh, the Houdini Museum, was a very kind, kind man, uh, and he was he was very kind and generous with me and giving me tours of the museum. And I have on um, one, I have an idea that I want to do. Uh, an escape over Niagara Falls. And so I talked to the producers. I said, I want to do it. They said, well, we can't afford that. So let's start with this and we'll work our way up to do this. So, so you know, we kind of worked something out. So I went and I, you know, I did, did uh, I can't talk about too much about it, but uh, yeah, it's the, it, it'll air in a couple of weeks and it's, they're using my segment as like the main commercial for, Canada's got talent right now across across Canada. So, um, oh, that's awesome. yeah. So again, I mean, I, I'm not overly happy with it. I mean, it was it was good. Um, yeah, I better not talk. I can't say how thing, th things went, but I mean, it was pretty cool. But I got I got two pages of notes. I got other questions. We don't want to get you in trouble. Yeah, uh, okay. NDAs and all. So, um, motivational speaking, what do you talk about in your motivational talks without giving too much away? But well, no, I mean, I, I just I talk about life lessons. I talk about uh, how failure is important in life because, again, as the valuable experience that we can learn. So, I mean, the only people that don't fail is the people that don't try, right? I mean, uh, it's it's easy. You you never want to fail in life. Don't try anything. Uh, you know, about, about achieving the impossible, about visualization. Uh, a lot of the escapes that I do, it's, it's, it's impossible to rehearse them, right? You can't practice hanging over Hoover Dam, you know, 10 times before you do it. You can only practice bits and pieces of it, right? When, when the police lock you up in a jail cell, you can't really practice that. You can practice, again, bits and pieces of it, um, you know, getting chained to a roller coaster or, you know, locked in with sharks you, you can't practice that just little bits and pieces so you you use visualization you have to see it things have to become clear in your mind um and this translates to anything we do in life whether it's going for a job interview or standing up and talking in front of your class you have to visualize it you have to see it um you know po part of it is is positive thinking right uh, you know, what we see, we we create. Um, and, you know, that 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 kind of stuff as getting people motivated, teaching them how to how to think, how to not to panic, um, you know, and how to have have goals and dreams and and how to work hard. Uh, you talked about at the beginning of this. I was working on a movie last last uh, week. And. Um, Again, uh, this will be the first I've, I've talked about it, um, but we were filming a movie 40 years ago. 40 years ago, I had an experience in my life uh, where I met a young friend of mine, uh, uh, Phil Porter, when I was working at the Children's Hospital teaching magic for the kids, 1983. So here we are 40 years later. And my, my friend, Philip, um, who, who we became good friends, uh, teaching magic and learning magic. And, you know, we, we were both teenagers. Uh, he wanted to learn how to get out of handcuffs and jails. And he was going through, uh, he had cancer, um, the same type of cancer that Terry Fox had, the, the famous uh, one-legged uh, uh, marathon runner that ran across Canada and raised millions and millions of dollars for cancer research. And so I taught him, he was able to do it. So we started doing jailbreaks. We were, we'd go to 
uh, RCMP detachments and, and escape from them, getting locked up in their handcuffs and jail cells and uh, prisons and city police. And uh, we, and then he, uh, his cancer relapsed and he got a make a wish trip and he got to go down and see Doug Henning in Los Angeles, become friends with, with Doug and Doug gave him a bunch of stuff. And then, you know, we go to psychics trying to find cures for what he's doing and faith healers and, you know, all this really, really cool stuff. I, I, I know the people listening aren't going to see, but I mean, I've got a, a picture of, of him and I locked up there. We did as a poster for raising money for cancer. And, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, he passed away uh, from cancer in 1986 at the age of 15. Oh. But he always, you know, used to say, I always believe in the magic of your dreams. And, and you know, this was before I did any big TV specials or anything like that. We always talked about, you know, how we'd meet the amazing Randy or, you know, get to work with David Copperfield and things. And he never got to to live those, the, those dreams. Um, but I always, uh, around my neck, I've had a, St. Christopher medal, and I, I had that inscribed since, since the early 80s. I said, always believe in the magic of your dreams. And so what we did is uh, a few years ago, uh, author uh, Carolyn Gray wrote a book about me called uh, Dean Gunderson, The Making of an Escape Artist uh, that she published. And, you know, it got interested. In, and so they got funding. People put some money in uh, to make it into a movie. So we've been filming the last little while. Uh, you know, I'm not in the movie. I'm because I'm there's a young dean. Uh, they found an actor that looked like me when I was, you know, like 18, 19 years old with lots of hair and all that kind of stuff. Better looking, taller, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, so we've been filming that, doing the jail breaks and, and, and uh, you know, all, all the, these cool things and, and shows. So it's been really kind of interesting. Uh, going back and and you know seeing the same scenes that happened 40 years ago and when this happened and Phil and I were doing our adventures I knew that someday this would be a movie and I never gave up on that and always you know told the story about, about you know him and I and kept that in the back of my head and so you know dreams and goals they're not cheap right it's not like we have a dream and and it's going to happen it takes hard work. It takes dedication. It takes perseverance, you know, never giving up, never surrendering uh, and, you know, lots of rejection and, and failure. And so here we are 40 years later, um, you know, it's getting, getting made into a movie and will be released in September. So, well, I was doing research for you for this podcast and yeah, I got your website, I got your bio, bio and all this stuff. And I'm looking at all, also Google search. Yeah. And I saw the book for sale on um, at Walmart. I don't know where else it's for sale at. But I was like, oh, wow. And I'm reading about it. And I'm like, I wonder if that's true. So did you have leukemia as a little boy? Is that your first escape trick? You escaped from having leukemia? Or was that him? Yeah, yeah no, that, that, that was true. When I was 12 years old, I was diagnosed uh, with leukemia and given like a 20% chance of, of living. Uh, and I was in this in the seventies. So I became kind of like a guinea pig, you know, three years of radiation, chemotherapy, losing my hair, getting all kinds of, you know, bone marrow injections and, you know, things and, and, you know, uh, so it kind of really toughened me up and I couldn't play sports anymore. And that's when I really started to turn into magic and Houdini because I would missed a lot of school and it made me something uh, special. Rather than being the sick kid that was dying of, of leukemia, I became the kid that could do magic tricks, right? So when I'd go to junior high and I was bald, now being bald is cool, right? I mean, you know, right? nobody thinks about it. But, you know, back then in the 70s, everybody had long hair and, you know, I, I'd wear a hat to cover up my baldness and, you know, kids would pull it off and, Tease and I, you know, used to say, I, I, you know, well, well, one day I'm going to make all this disappear, right? You know, it's the the magic is going to happen. Um, so yeah, that part that part is is a, a real part of my life. I again, I don't talk about it a, a lot, but yeah, it's something that definitely shaped me, and it's one of those things in life where I would never ever want to have to go through, uh, you know, having cancer or leukemia again. Um, 
and this April will be uh, 46 years as a survivor. Wow. So, uh, you know, it's been, been a lot of years. But, you know, the, again, the things that have taught me, I've never smoked in my life. I've never drank alcohol. I've never done drugs. Um, you know, it took all that out of my, my life and helped me to be the best person that I, I, I can be. Um, so, you know, there, there was lots of things. And, and so when I talk about the book or I talk about the movie, this is something I don't talk about to profit from because when, when they asked me about like royalties and stuff for the book, I said, I don't want a cent. I don't want to profit off my story of cancer, my story with a friend and to give it all to the Cancer Society or the Cancer Foundation. And same with the movie. I mean, I've worked on this movie for, for months and months and months. Uh, and I've never, ever taken a cent for it. So I don't do it to, to, to profit from it, but to, to share the story of, uh, you know, my friend Phil and the adventures and, you know, try and, try and give some, some hope for people that are going through cancer or illnesses uh, now, because, I mean, you know, it, it hits home and it can be, uh, you know, pretty devastating, not just for the person that's sick, but for the whole family. It's, you right. know, you're you well aware. Well, her dad's a cancer doctor for kids. So, I mean, it's close to our family. So we know, yeah, we, she's seen it all growing up. Her dad, if her dad wore a suit to work, it was a bad day, you know, because he's got to go to a funeral instead of taking care of little kids. Uh, so it's, yeah, yeah. So we see it a lot. And I'd go to the um, children's hospital every Christmas and perform on Christmas day because oh. all the presents already opened and nothing else to do. And those kids can't go home at Christmas. They try to send everybody home. So if they can't go there, they feel like they need your love even more yeah. because they're not even allowed to go home for Christmas. That's how sick they are. They'll take yeah. send them home to get them back the next day. But if they can't send them home, they're kind of stuck. Yeah. But um, yeah. Really no, I, like you know what? That's, that's a great thing. I'm, I'm really glad, glad you do that. And, and again, my first shows as a teenager were at the Cancer Foundation, you know, doing magic for, for the, the kids. That was like my very first shows. So... Um, you know, I, I, there's, you know, you think you're giving them something by giving them, you know, magic, but they yeah. give you so much more, uh, yeah. you know, as a performer and I, I, and being able to do that, Wes, I, I know you've, you've probably experienced that exact same thing. So, well, we've done you know, it. We've my, done a couple different hospitals. Sometimes, sometimes there's 50 kids, sometimes there's five. And, mm -hmm. you know, we always leave and it's like, man, I wish there was more kids. No, this yeah. is great. They sent them all home. There's no sick kids. Right. This is a good thing. So it's kind of a, because I want to perform. I want to keep going. You know how it is. But um, we only have a couple more minutes. I just want to tell you and the world how proud I am of you. Because I'm looking through, I'm Googling, and I found the book, and I found this, and then I found Celebrity Net Worth, Dean Gunnerson. Uh, <laughs> You've done okay for yourself. You've done okay for yourself, sir. I wasn't looking it up. It just popped up, sir. Don't tell my ex-wives. Please don't. <laughs> God, dang. People say, Dean, what was what was your most dangerous escape? And I was like, oh, God, escaping from my ex-wives. And I was like, no, 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 that was my, wasn't my most dangerous. That was my most expensive. Jeez. <laughs> so you guys can go to his website, and it is alwaysescaping.com. And he has postcards, he has T-shirts, he has posters and 8 by 10s that you can get. He can autograph it and send it right to you. And, I mean, the prices are great. So it's in U.S. dollars, and uh, it's they're good deals. It's not like it's crazy. Yeah, it hasn't been updated for a while. But, yeah, I've, I've always prided myself on creating really cool posters. Uh, most of my posters aren't on there, but uh, I've, I've always done, like, a really neat series of of uh, art, artistic posters of the different escapes that I've, I've done over the years and stuff. And I'll, I'll share them with you on your, uh, when we do the, the video segment of this and anybody listening can go back and, and, and watch it if they, they want to want to see more. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. We're running out of time. Is there anything else you want to promote? We got you here. We got like a minute left. Anything else you want to promote that I missed? Yeah, so like I said, that's it. We'll, we'll be on the, the GOAT coming up in a couple of weeks. Keep an eye out for that. And uh, hopefully the, the, uh, the, you get a chance to see the, the, the movie that we're, that, that we're coming up. And, you know, it just life is one day at a time, man. Nothing is impossible if you truly believe. So I know you guys know that, and it's something I live by. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's true for all of us. So 
Well, let me know when that movie comes out. I'll promote the heck out of it for you. I love you, dude. You're awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we're out of time. There's only one more thing left to say. See, See you, you next week. week. Check us out online at wesisley.com and patreon.com forward slash Wes underscore Isley for behind the scenes videos, blooper videos, never before seen footage, discounts on merchandise, magic trick tutorials, and more. That's Wes Isley spelled W-E-S-I-S-E-L-I. -S -E